Well, today we have the pleasure of being together with Kyle Green from the Green Mortgage Team. Welcome to our podcast. Thanks, Ozzy. It's an interesting uh, time of the year for you. Everybody else uh, seems to be complaining that things are slowing down and you just told me you may have one of your best months. Yeah, it's kind of a weird one. Uh, September is really good and October is going to be your best month of the year. So there is something to the adage that if you have a built-in business and good referrals and do a good job, you'll be busy whether the market is good or not. Pretty much, yeah. 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 So you do a lot of referral business? Yeah, most of our stuff is, uh, is referral, so repeat clients and realtors. Well, you know, you're now one of Canada's top leading brokers in the what, top 100? Top, top, uh, top 20, yeah. In the top 20 in Canada. Wow, congratulations, yeah. quite an achievement. How did you start out? Uh, that's an interesting story. Um, I was working at a local credit union in the, in the area and I was complaining a little bit that I wasn't getting a lot of hours there. So I'd worked there for five months and uh, I was talking to my friend on, if you guys remember MSN. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So talking to a friend of mine on MSN and, and complaining a little bit and she mentioned that her parents um, uh, were looking for some help doing some mind-numbing paperwork as she said it. Um, I decided to go to the interview anyways and check it out, uh, but her parents were mortgage brokers and uh, this was in 2006 when you know, mortgage brokers were becoming a lot more of a, of a force in, uh, in Canada. And um, yeah, I decided to join the team and it was a nice experience. It was uh, very different than the unionized environment of working with a credit union. Instead of having a you know, ceiling over your head, it's you get paid what you're worth and what you produce. And how much you work, right? Exactly. It's funny, sometimes that is still the biggest uh, secret of success. You actually have, have to, to do work. something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny, we, we, we talk about, I know that um, Simon Sinek uh, had this, uh, this great TED talk about, you know, the what, the how, and the why. Uh, what would you say is your why? Yeah, well, I think my why for what, why I do what I do, and, and strictly as a mortgage broker, was... And I remember getting asked this question a few years into my career, and I didn't, didn't give a very good answer, and the person I was talking to kept pressing until I gave an appropriate answer, I suppose. But I guess when I really drilled it down, I've always been uh, really into people, money, and numbers. Uh, from a young age, I always like engaging with people socially, um, always very good at math, and always, looked, uh, always really looked numbers. So um, being able to do all three of these in, in this job is, is, is perfect fit. Um, on top of that too, I think as I've gotten a little older, I think that managing people and growing a business is another, another thing that really is something that's a passion of mine. So um, as a mortgage broker, it's really easy. You can start off, you know, starting up in your basement instead of going out and starting a restaurant and borrowing $100,000 and all the risk that comes along with that. You can start off small and slowly grow and grow and you hire your first assistant and then your second and now I have seven, uh, seven staff in my team and you can grow organically that way. I think my why for real estate investing, and I learned this right away actually as after I first went to your, um, my very first you know, eye-opening experience was your REAG meeting in 2000, I think it was 2007, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it just opened my eyes to investing in real estate and, and being able to make money while I sleep. As much as I don't mind working and putting in the work, you want to you know, be able to live off of the fruits of your labor and eventually not have to work 70 hours a week. You know. But, but first you have to actually go through the actual work. I, I find it amazing sometimes we go listen to an exciting speaker and we're always worried about did we understand enough and yet there's no stupid people. We understand everything. We take furious notes. We understood the material in the marrow of our bones and then two weeks later we, we open the trunk of our car and there are all the notes and we didn't do it. Right? And I think yeah. if you want to be in high achievement, you have to actually apply some of the things that you've learned. Well, one of the things uh, I did and we still do is the big conferences. And I remember that my mortgage broker that was the featured speaker at the time didn't show. <laughs> or rather, he was incapacitated, let me put it this way. Uh, and, but you were there. And so I said, look, let's go to the stage and let's do this. And without hesitation, you came along. <laughs> yeah, I remember that day very, very vividly, <laughs> Um, I think I was 20 or 21 at the time. Yeah. Um, this is my, I think it was my second show I'd done with you. And 
He said, Kyle, I need you to go on stage at 1.30. I'm like, I have no material or anything. <laughs> so we went to the lunchroom and uh, we quickly rattle off an FAQ, I think, yeah, right? right? Some, yeah. uh, some questions. You just said, Kyle, what can I ask you on stage? Yeah. Um, I remember peeking in the room before I went up there. I'm like, holy cow, there's yeah. 600 people in the yeah. room. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but we did it and it wasn't perfect, but it worked. And I remember having a bunch of people come up to the stage, following me back to my booth, and the amount of business and exposure I got from that. I remember yeah. telling you after that, uh, after that day, I said, Ozzy, I'm going to do this every time from now. Yeah, and the interesting thing is that you have to sort of break through the ceiling, right? Yeah. Uh, you've got to try it. Of course, it's scary to 600 people. It's scary to do 20 people at first, but 600, and then get thrown sort of to the wolves. And you were relatively very, very young at the time, you know, in terms of, uh, being in business for a long period of time, you're, you're searching. But the key is that when you expose yourself times and go through that fear, it was funny, I just talked to Janet LePage who created some 10,000 units in under five years, a billion dollars to the real estate, and the whole time she had to overcome her fear factor. It was the fear of carrying those enormous $100 million mortgage and yeah. all of the things. So we have to go our own road. I know myself, the first time I was asked to, to, uh, to speak on stage, I was petrified, you know? You have to break through the ceiling. Then when you do, you have sort of the endorphins work and you feel actually quite pretty good about it. Yeah, yeah. But I think also because you were young, you got sort of the question of, well, how do you know the business, right? And mm -hmm. you always had a good answer. For instance, why should you choose a mortgage broker over a bank? Yeah, well, I mean, Essentially, what we do as mortgage brokers is we negotiate with about 40 different lenders to find our clients the best rate and the best product, and we get paid by the lender. Um, what we're finding, though, especially because of the new you know, stress test that has come out and all these other rule changes, when I first started in the business 12 years ago, you could our, our job really was just to find the client the best rate, because you can get a client approved with any lender. You threw it at the dartboard and it would stick, uh, for the most part anyways. But the business really has changed over the last little while and, and really strong clients no, don't necessarily fit with their own bank's box anymore. And so we're finding that a stronger client is coming to us that has always been a bank client. They've always talked to TD or RBC or whoever it is and they can't believe that they just got declined by their bank because they've been banking there for 25 years, they have a relationship there and the reality is with all the government regulations, it's not a relationship banking model anymore. It's It's really a numbers game now, and do you fit the box? And you know, it's income almost overpoweringly. You it, have to 100%, have income. yeah. It's, it's such, it, it, the whole focus, focus with, from the government is all of revolving around income and, um, and making sure that you're, you're showing income on paper. You know, if you have rental properties, the income needs to be on your tax returns. If you're self-employed, you need to claim enough income to qualify for the mortgages. So any non-income qualified type of product is, has been getting hammered by the government and after bank audits, a lot of these lenders are, are actually having to remove their products off the line. It's kind of amazing. You, know, you sometimes have somebody with huge assets, but not the income that's required to service a new mortgage. And, but that, I think, is where you come in because you go to 40 lenders. You mm -hmm. can look at a client and say, you know what, you, you have a good portfolio, but you will not qualify at the TD or the Nova Scotia you may have a chance at these three institutions, right? Yeah. And then you take them there, right? Exactly, and that's where certain institutions will have some kind of net worth program or some kind of program that they may fight into, but yeah. a lot of banks don't. Yeah. Well, what, what makes you different though? You have a lot of mortgage brokers, aren't they all the same? Oh, almost. <laughs> <laughs> not quite, not quite. So, I mean, every mortgage broker is gonna say, we have great rates, we have great service, that kind of stuff. But the, what it really, and, and Oz, you helped me a lot with this in my, earlier in my career was initially carving out a niche. As soon as I became an expert in real estate investing, it gave people right. a reason to talk to me. Even when meeting with a new realtor and, and you know, realtors get, get called and, and, um, and uh, you know, mortgage brokers are bombarding them, asking them, hey, send me your business, please. Um, it's not the right way to approach it though. I mean, even if we met with a realtor, we'd say, look, I know you already probably have somebody you deal with, um, but if you have somebody who has a few rental properties, this is my area of expertise. Right. I have a skill set that is you know, above and beyond the majority of other brokers and bankers, and that's where I can add some value to what you do. And once you show that you can do the complicated stuff, people start to do the easy stuff with you too. 
So it really helped me stand out. And, and actually, eventually I was able to turn, you alluded to this earlier, my younger age from a negative into a positive because yes, I am this, this young, but yes, I know my stuff. Well, I think it's also, it's, it's very simple. My job is to get you the best possible rate and the mortgage that you want in the fastest period of time with a minimum inconvenience. Each yeah. doesn't enter into it, right? I know how to do it. But you're right, like in the beginning, some of our the deals we, we, we did together, uh, Ralph and I, and we had another partner, Dave Barnes, those were condominiums, they're all in the $50,000 range. So the big mortgage that you put on was maybe $37,000. You, you weren't going to get rich on it. Yeah. But you did them anyways. Mm -hmm. And the key was, and once you do one mortgage for me, well, then you have all my information and it's ready for me when my house mortgage comes due to go for you for the renewal. And so yeah. by paying the dues with all those small mortgages, you ended up creating a portfolio of trust with your people. And I think when I talk to anybody about Kyle, that's what they feel like. They feel they're in good hands. They really do because you go that extra mile. Mm -hmm. Well. well What's happening anyways out there right now? The interest rates are going up, uh, the interest rates are going down, or what is your view on interest rates? They're moving up, and that has been the trend over the last 12 months. Um, bond rates have gone up about 1%, and so fixed rates have gone up nearly that. Um, also, we're seeing the Bank of Canada is starting to, again, they, they say publicly, and they have been for years, that they're going to increase the uh, overnight lending rate, which is where banks base their prime rate off of, but um, they're actually doing it now. Um, they're starting to look at the data and say, yes, it's, it's time to move up. So um, we're finding that, uh, that a few more of our clients are, are starting to lean towards fixed rates. But at the same time, too, earlier in the summer, a lot of lenders came out with really aggressive, uh, deeply discounted variable rates. And so now you start to look at it and realize, well, if there's a large enough gap or spread between a variable rate and a fixed rate, we have some clients thinking, well, for the large difference in, in margin between a fixed and a variable, and the flexibility of variables. Some clients are still choosing to do that, even though they understand that we're probably now finally in an interest rate uh, environment where rates will start rising, as opposed to this constant you know, falling or, or flattening out of the market, which is what we've seen for the last decade or so. Um, but, uh, but people do have to be prepared that the rate that you get today, especially if you're going variable, is unlikely to be the rate for the entire five years. It'll probably be higher. So you have to sort of work out what would be the fixed rate be now and what is the difference between a variable rate and then play some what ifs. You know, what if it goes up a half a percent from here or one yeah. percent? And I'm, I'm quite sure that, and, and you've told me that before, that you can sit down and make a good case for, you would have to almost go up three percent before the fixed rate might be better than the, the variable rate. Yeah, and right now that's probably, you know, if you, if you looked at the math, um, Right now, most variable rates are priced at about 1% lower than a fixed rate. And that means that the, the prime rate would have to go up, not just four times, because a lot of people look at, well, right. if the rate goes up four times, then I'd be at the same rate. But yes, you would have been below the rate, the fixed rate, for the first you know, X number of months. So really, um, if you look at it and assume that the rate uh, gets bumped up um, at the same uh, interval for throughout a five-year term, it would have to go up eight times. Mm -hmm. And even still, if it went up eight times evenly, because the mortgage is essentially front load and you're paying off more principal in the beginning, by the time the rates are higher, it's on a smaller balance, you'd still actually be slightly better off with the variable rate. And so we start looking at that eight, eight you know, moves up in the next five years is not necessarily aggressive, but it, you know, that would be, um, that'd be quite a statement too. Well, the thing is, there's uh, interest rates are a mugs game to predict anyhow, but I felt for the last... Uh, I guess since May of 2017, um, I have a friend of mine who runs a bank in Frankfurt and he, he felt and told me that between 10 and 13 nations actually sat down and f fixed their plan in raising the rates. They want to get back to a 3% wow. rate. And when you look around the world, that's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to, because the negative rates haven't worked, they can no longer fine tune the economy. So anyway, so I mm -hmm. think the rate is going to go up, and so I'm, I'm a simple mind. I, I rather personally like my mortgage rate fixed for five years, or for at least the length of time I want to keep my property. Of course, if I want to flip a property, I don't want it fixed. I yeah. want to have it variable, but if I want to keep it. 
But maybe, you know, I, I'm quite sure if I, I sat down with you and I listened to Dustin, uh, who argued uh, Dustin is another mortgage broker, who I always say is a great guy, who really believes, no, you should go that short-term route because for that very reason, you have to need eight bumps for it to go higher, right? So, but it'll be interesting to see how it all comes out. But for most people, I think the important thing is, is the money going to be there? And as long as we feel that the money is going to be there, we can play the variable rate. Yeah, that's an, another point that we make with our clients too, is that if you're, especially our, our real estate investor clients, you're more likely to be refinancing or redoing a mortgage inside of the five-year term you choose because you want to access the equity out of the home to buy another property. So if you're an active investor and you're trying to actively grow a portfolio, then I think that uh, a variable can make a lot of sense because let's say that you get a mortgage with TD today because yeah. TD is your best fit. But three years into the mortgage, the property value goes up by $200,000. You want to tap into that equity to buy another mm. property. Now TD's changed the rules because it seems like every six or 12 months, major banks change their rules in a drastic way. Now maybe TD isn't the right fit for you to have to actually go to another bank to get that refinance done. If you're in a five-year fixed rate mortgage, the penalty could easily be two sure. to five times more expensive. Sure. The, the penalty is something there. Well, it's interesting that uh, you didn't, don't just talk real estate, you actually did, uh, at a very young age, did a deal in Kelowna that uh, was mm -hmm. over a million dollars. And how much money did you put down? Nothing, Ozzy, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> in fact, um, I did two mortgages, a refinance and the purchase mortgage uh, for the investor and got paid on the mortgages. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the whole idea. It's better to have a half a pie than no pie. And, and yeah. it's the proof in the pudding. When I look in our real estate action group, how many people actually made it work? I mean, it's work and it's worry, right? At the last minute, the lender can say, no, I want to change my... Yeah. my plan or I don't want to give you all of the money or the, any number of things can happen. But then when you do it, you actually did put a million dollar property together mm -hmm. without any money down. So it's entirely, uh, entirely uh, credible to you. So why do, should people go into real estate? I still believe it's a very safe investment asset class. Um, I, at most presentations I do, I usually bring up a, a little uh, chart and I go through, you know, why I've invested in real estate. But uh, there's essentially three ways you make money in real estate. There's cash flow, mortgage pay down, and appreciation. Um, cash flow is what a lot of people focus on. And in general, if you put 20% down, especially if you're buying in the lower mainland, it's really hard to get positive cash flow. You'd be, you'd be doing pretty good if you got neutral cash flow. So that's usually not where you're making a lot of your, your income or margin from. Mm -hmm. um, there's the appreciation aspect, which now in this market, people are thinking, okay, how much appreciation are we going to see? Uh, usually for my models, I use about a 3% annual appreciation uh, over a long period of time. So maybe you won't see it in the next three years or five years, but I think over a 10-year okay, period, it's yeah, <laughs> yeah, it will, right? It'll be zero, 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 and then 10, 10, 20, or right. more than that, yeah. right? So um, I, I usually use about 3% annually, which I think averaging out, it seems reasonable, as I think the last 25 years has been more like 6 or 7%. Um, that means if you put 20% down, you're returning your investment for every 1% of appreciation is actually 5% return on your money. Sure. So 3% appreciation is a 15% return on your money per year. The thing that people forget about and don't think about at all is forget that the property even appreciates at all. Forget you even put any money in your pocket and the tenant just pays for all of your expenses like your mortgage and property taxes. Just having the tenant paid on your mortgage for you represents about a 75 to 9% return on your money per year right. depending on the mortgage rate. And that's really where you can make your money. And so a lot of time I ask people in the audience, so who here is making 75 to 9% in their stock portfolio year after year? And it's incredible how many times I've asked this question. It's one in 50 hands go up. So if the room has 400 people in it, then there's about eight hands that go up. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's the key, you know, is that in the past when interest rates were 10 and 12%, you paid off maybe 10% of your mortgage's principal. Now yeah. you have maybe 40%. Yeah. So every time you make a mortgage payment, 40% of that or more go into your own genes. I, years ago, I made a speech at UBC to the students. I said, look, you guys are 23 years old. Just go and buy a, a property in Kamloops, let's say, say an $80,000 condo. And let's presume it never goes up for the next 17 years. And let's say you put that mortgage over 17 years instead of 25, and you make, say, $800 a month. And that pays really for everything. But you don't have much cash flow, but that's what happens. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're 40, you now have $800 for the rest of your life. 
Yeah. If you did it five times, that's 4,000 for the rest of your life. Now remember, it didn't go up. You assume the rent didn't go up, the writing up. Now $4,000 borrows you a million dollars. You're a true blue millionaire. You didn't really do anything. You learned a little bit about a small town, not a one-horse town. You learned a little bit about property management, and yeah, maybe you had a tenant from hell for a while. And the key is that after maybe 12 years or so, you're already getting 1500 a month. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing isn't sort of static. And so that model, uh, you've proven it. You bought that million dollar property mm -hmm. without any down payment. Since then, you bought a lot of other uh, properties. Now, we're talking mostly about residential mortgages. Why aren't we talking about commercial? What do you think about commercial mortgages? Yeah, I mean, your, our typical client usually is looking at residential um, real estate and therefore you get residential financing on it because it is cheaper and generally the leverage is, is better on it. But um, the last few years, we've seen a major increase to the amount of commercial financing that we're doing. And part of that is, is a philosophy shift and a shift in, in my own business. But a lot of it is, is just due to the market. Um, the residential lending has become a focal point for the government to, I don't want to say use the word attack, but it's the best word I can really think of. They're coming out with new rules and regulations that continue to get tighter and tighter and tighter on the residential side. Commercial lending really hasn't changed in 25 plus years. And so people that are having difficulties because they don't have enough income, they're going to find on the commercial side that their personal income isn't brought into the equation as much. So you qualify for commercial property. So that's uh, residential real estate if it's five or more units or something like a strip mall or industrial park or something like that. You're qualifying for a commercial mortgage, the strength of the deal lies more with the property and less with the applicant. Mm -hmm. So we find that people that are retired or have a large net worth that don't have a lot of income are a really good fit for commercial. Um, you, we have people that are retired and have maybe a $50,000 a year income going out and buying an apartment building and getting a $5 million mortgage. You'd never get a mortgage that size on the residential side. Because the income that the government wants is there, only it comes from the tenants. Right? Correct, yeah. And, and on the residential side, they don't use all of the rental income to help people qualify for the mortgages, right? There's two other things, of course. First of all, you have foreigners do not pay any foreign mm -hmm. tax, you know, whereas on residential now it's 25%. So buying a commercial property for a foreigner is something they're going to look on more and more in terms of if they want to invest in Canada. Mm -hmm. The other thing on a commercial mortgage, what about the rates? Are they that much higher? Or? Yeah, they're higher. Um, they're usually 0.75 to 1.25% higher. In general, it's about 1% higher. And do you, what kind of a down payment you need on a commercial? Yeah, that's where it varies quite a bit. So in general, most of the time it's 25 to 35% down. But you can actually get as little as 15% down on an apartment building through CMHC. It's just really difficult to get CMHC to agree with the, the valuation and agree yeah, with it. So you <laughs> so. might have a bona fide appraisal from a bona fide appraiser, mm -hmm. but CMHC says, no, we're going to use our own. Yeah, because they'll use their own metrics for, for certain things. So they'll look at the, um, the last 10 years of vacancies and say, hey, well, in 2007, the vacancies went from 4% to 10%. So we're going to use that number, right? Yeah. So you have some silly things like that. But yeah. on, for the right deal, um, CMHC will still do that. Well, it's interesting when I look at some of the mortgages some of our members got, it's kind of astounding. The rates were actually pretty darn good, uh, even as compared to commercial. And then larger amounts than I think they by themselves would have never qualified for unless they had a val valuable uh, commercial assets. So I think yeah. I agree with you that that is an area of expansion. The other thing, of course, is we're talking about residential mortgages, we're talking about commercial. I have seen no... In my lifetime, I've seen a lot of different money situations. I remember a, a time when money just wasn't available. You'd have 10 sales, real good sales, willing buyer, willing seller, and seven of them couldn't get financing. So we've seen that terrible part. Then we've seen money actually thrown at us the last two years, oh. where I blame Polos entirely for uh, our finance minister, entirely for uh, our increases in real estate value. But now it, it's, the money is still out there. I mean, corporations are gushing cash, individuals are gushing cash. So is there another source that you can tap into rather than the commercial lending market, CMHC or the banks? Yeah, well, it's interesting because we do a lot of private lending as well. And we're finding a stronger client coming to us that doesn't qualify with the major banks and doesn't fit within, within the confines of, of what they have to fit into. Um, private lending is an area that, uh, that has been growing substantially. So the amount of money in it 
and the de so the supply of cash going into it and the uh, demand for the money has been going up at the same time. I think people are, especially in uh, Greater Vancouver, people believe in real estate as a uh, investment class and an asset class. And instead of investing their money in stocks, a lot of people think, well, I want to invest it in real estate, but in a different way. I don't want to own the real estate. I want to be a debt holder. Uh, so we're doing a lot of private uh, private lending right now. And the private uh, lending, the rates are quite a bit higher, though. They definitely are, yeah. So private lending uh, usually starts at something like 7% and goes up to 12 13%, depending on whether it's a first mortgage or a second mortgage and where the property is located in general. A house in Vancouver is going to be a better security than a, uh, a condo in a small town, right? So it just depends on, on what, you're, what you're doing. But we're starting to, uh, we're connecting people that have money and want to invest in private mortgages to people that are needing to borrow the money. Yeah, so what is your main thing? You still look at the asset though primarily, right? Yeah, it's, it's primarily asset-based lending. So the client is, and the story of what's going on with the client is something you want to bring into the equation. Um, but it's not the be-all and end-all. Really, the best way of looking at private lending is the major banks will do what they can during underwriting to eliminate the risk of default. And a pri as a private lender, you want to just assume that default will happen. So how much are you lending on the property and what kind of property is it? AKA, would you own it? And um, how long would it take for you to get it on the market, sell it, and just get your money back? If there was a default, right? Yep, yeah, of course. Well, that's the whole idea. But I think it's it's more and more valuable. I, in another lifetime, I was the president of a mortgage investment corporation. Is that the kind of lender that is out there now in the private market? Or? Yeah, there's there's two ways you can invest in, in private mortgages. So you can invest into a MIC, a mortgage investment corporation. And it's almost like, a, it's a, like owning shares in the company that then lends out. And so the benefit of doing that is that your money is being spread amongst a large number of deals. So if one borrower goes and defaults, it's not all just your money that's at risk. Everybody takes a share in the profits and the, and the losses. Um, the downside is that you, you don't get to pick which deals the, the mix are doing. You're, you are the in, entirely uh, looking at the management. Who is exactly. the manager? What is their track record? Well, the other yeah. thing, of course, on the mix is you can use your RSP, right? You can. Uh, mm -hmm can use your pension funds to invest in a MIC, as long as it's a Canadian corporation. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes people have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in an RSP and are leery about the stock market, and that would be one way to do it. Yeah. Well, how do you make sure that the people that are running it are worthwhile? Do you do your own testing? Or? Yeah, I mean, we, we go through we, uh, we go through the client's application, as we would any, any other client's application. Um, get the right documents, make sure they don't owe money to the CRA, make sure the property is good. And uh, in general, they're usually our own clients. And so we know them, you know, a little bit more intimately than, than just having a, you know, Joe Blow off the street apply with us. A lot of them are investors. Um, a lot of our investors are, go with private, are going with private lenders to do deals because even though the rates are higher, there's less regulations and it's easier for them to qualify. And especially if you're doing a flip, the interest rate is relevant, but not as relevant. Um, because you're only borrowing the money for three or six months. So the total interest cost isn't as high as if it was a buy and hold rental property you're trying to hold for five years, where it'd be almost impossible to cash flow it. Yeah. No, it, it certainly, it, there's room for it all, but it's like whether it's a joint venture you enter it or a limited partnership, in the end you're buying the management. You're buying the general manager, the general partner, yeah. and that's where you have to do your due diligence you know what did they do before ask them some serious questions and if they are huffy at you asking questions well how huffy will they get down the road when the, when there's some big problems so well look so you're in the mortgage lending business and you have you in the in the, in the residential and the commercial anything new on a on anything new on the horizon <laughs> yeah um, yeah after we've been um, looking at this for quite a while but uh, we also go into the home insurance game as oh, well interesting yeah, yeah. yeah. so um, and from a business perspective home insurance is, is a great complement to what we do because when you get a mortgage you need to have home insurance uh, the banks want to ensure that you have home insurance so if it's a house you have to have fire and in, in general earthquake insurance and um, if you're buying into a strata unit, then usually the strata already has insurance on the shell of the building. But you should still get contents insurance to just protect your own, your own uh, contents, like your furniture. And keep in mind that you're, if you have a flood or a fire, you'll have the condo uh, rebuild the shell of the building, but none of the appliances or anything like that are going to show up. So having contents insurance is still important. Um, yeah, but from our perspective, 
you know, we, we do well, we make a reasonable income on a per transaction basis on the mortgage side. Um, but it's, I've, I've seen other brokers try to sell their business and try to eventually get out at some point. And the value of a mortgage brokerage is very difficult to put your finger on. It's, it's tough because, you know, the green mortgage team, most people are going to assume it's the Kyle Green show, even though I've made a lot of efforts to, you know, make it the green team. Um, home insurance, on the other hand, is a very sellable asset. So it's a, another investment for me. It's a good, good business strategy, you know. Yeah. Well, Carl, it's, it's certainly very interesting. We started out by, you know, what is somebody's why? And when I look from the outside looking in, <clears throat> what do you do? Well, you're in the mortgage business. How do you do it? You, you do it through a focus on, uh, on people. And why do you do it? I think the, the reason why from, from the outside looking at you is you like to create an environment for your people where everybody can grow. Your customers, the parties you have are legendary. They all go to the, <laughs> the racing track and watch a horse race yeah, while you yeah. wine and dine them. And uh, you, you have constantly engaged with your clients. So the great thing there is that they see each other. They see, oh, I got a mortgage from Carl five years ago. And, uh, and I had a real hard situation and, and he found a solution. Yeah. So I think your why is you really, really believe in your clients and believe in the future of the business. Yeah, definitely. We like to help people. We like to help people. I wish you well, and I thank you very much for coming. Um, I think that everybody that deals with you uh, in the mortgage side is well looked after. Have a great day. Thanks, Ozzy. And that's all. Live life large.